Anyways, I'm Stephen Roach. <laughs> and you are the art of God. Several years ago, I told my wife, God's given me my life message. She said, what is it? And I said, it's creativity. I said, there's something unshakable stirring in my heart about creativity, and I suspect that it's burning in the heart of God as well. And I said, it's about so much more than whether we dance in our worship or we have an arts department at church. No, this goes down to the core of our being and who we are as human beings created in His image. This is something primal. This is something ancient that, that seems to have been lost or distorted at the fall of man and something that cries out from the, the deepest place in us to be restored. I said it's about bearing the image of the creative God who made us in his image. That's the message I said to her. A full recreation and restoration of the image of God within man. Because we are the art of God. You are the art of God. I am the art of God. I love Ephesians 2.10. He calls us his masterpiece. But when you dig around in the Greek, it's poema, which really means we are God's poems. We are God's poems. Jesus is the word of God, and we are the poems of God. That means Jesus is having an effect through our lives. And when words become poetry, incredible things take place. I began to travel more and more, both teaching at creative events and with the band, with Songs of Water, and everywhere that I went, I recognized that I wasn't the only one that had this growing hunger inside of me that said, there's something stirring about creative expression. Have any of you guys felt that same burning? There's something stirring. There, it's everywhere you look. It's in the body of Christ, and it's outside the body of Christ. Have you done a Google search to see what comes up when you type in the word creativity? It's over 800,000 websites. There's just been a worldwide surge of creativity where people are just recognizing there's, there's something to this inside of us as human beings that's longing to come out. It felt like a movement stirring, but it wasn't led by a charismatic personality or a denomination or a people group. It was an underground brooding that was happening beneath the currents of popular culture. The more I studied creativity, I saw that it had vast theological implications, much more than I'm qualified to speak about. But it's a wealth of understanding the nature of God and a wealth of understanding our own nature when we began to study creativity. The more I studied, the more I was convinced that this message, this message of creative expression being restored in us is central to the gospel story, central to the restoration of man. And I have a lot of other teachings that, that goes deep into that and that was me stopping a rabbit trail right there. You witnessed it happen. See, I'll be good at this preaching thing before. So needless to say, um, my good friend and the pastor here at Awake Church, Matt Peterson, a couple of years ago, he said, I really feel this stirring. I I'd like you to consider hosting a creative conference here at the church. And I said, well, let me think about, yeah, okay, when? <laughs> I could hardly get the words out before... I had planned the whole thing in my head. I had already seen you guys sitting here and I had already seen all of this taking place. And I could not wait to bring it to pass. This is the second um, Breath and Clay gathering that we've done. And I just wanted to share briefly just about what you've come to, the vision behind it, and what it is that, that we believe, that I believe that, that is happening. But the overarching vision for the breath and the clay is to inspire you and to challenge you to build community and to offer practical training and, and for the purpose of raising up artists who will work in excellence. 
having a heart rooted in the presence of God and branches that reach out and touch our cultures. To lay a solid foundation of Christian artists, even those who would not call themselves that by brand, so that we could all excel in our craft, having a family support system that future generations could learn from us and not have to make our same mistakes and reinvent the wheel. That's my hope for my kids too, you know? And ultimately, I want this to be a place that awakens God's creative spirit inside of us and gives us the courage and the support to step out of the boat, to do things that have no prototype, to go after those things he's put in our heart and to discover things that you don't even know are seeded in the soil of your heart already. There are seeds that God has planted in our hearts that we really don't even have an idea that they are there. You're sitting in the midst of one of it. I was traveling around the world playing music in smelly bars, and suddenly the Lord said, how would you like to do a creative event, and let's call all the tribes together and see what happens. I didn't know that seed was in my heart. So I said to inspire and to challenge to build community and offer practical training. What I mean by inspire is this. The root of the word inspiration, the, to be inspired literally means to be breathed upon by God. Look in the old dictionaries, the ones before the 1900s. See the root of the word inspire. It means to be breathed upon by God, or rather to breathe in the breath of God as he exhales into us. And I want us to be challenged because as much as I love art and music that exemplifies the beauty of the, the Christian symbolism and the heritage that we have in the faith that we as the family of God understand, I also want us to be challenged to use symbols and references and metaphors and things in our art uh, that are not so easily discerned. A biblical example of that that I've been thinking about recently is Moses and the bronze serpent. How weird is that? The only reference to a serpent in Scripture, to my knowledge at that point, was the serpent in the garden. And so suddenly, the Lord says to Moses when all kinds of craziness breaks out in the camp, because they were overcome by discouragement and disillusionment, suddenly the snakes got an entry point. And they came to Moses and they said, Moses, how can we get the enemy out of our camp? How can we get the discouragement and the disillusionment? How can we get the poison out of our camp? And he asked the Lord and the Lord said, I want you to make a sculpture. I want you to make a sculpture. Of what, Lord? I want you to make a sculpture of a serpent. I want you to put it on a pole and hold it up in front of the camp and when they look at this serpent, they're going to be healed. See, God is pretty strange. <laughs> so if you think I'm weird, just remember I'm created in his image. But I think that's beautiful. He told Moses to make a sculpture. He told Moses to make a work of art. And when the people beheld this work of art, which I think it's, it's uh, worth noting God didn't tell him to make a bronze serpent. Cho uh, Moses chose bronze. So there's a collaboration between the spirit of God and the spirit of man that is holy and that is designed by God. Even if you look at the art in the tabernacle, as much as that vision and that blueprint was dictated of what they were to do, even the artist made... Um, works of art that were not just realism. Some of the pomegranates and the things that they used, they used abstract colors to do these things. That was a rabbit trail that I took. <laughs> but if you've heard me speak, you will know that I rushed ahead and I'm gonna back up. So there's to inspire and to challenge, and then to build community, because see, I don't believe in the myth of the lone artist genius anymore. I just don't buy it. All art is a collaborative. All art is a collaboration. 
And if you trace it all the way back to the creativity of God, what you get is a community between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit working off of one another in community, in communion, and then birthing this. The Father speaks, the Word proceeds, and the Holy Spirit acts. It was a collaborative work of art from the beginning. And so I think that when you and I are in community with one another, in communion with him and in community with one another, I feel like that our art can challenge and inspire one another to just go off the charts. What do you say? We are so much better together than apart. I learned that when I got married. And if you've heard me speak at any point before, you will have likely heard me say that creativity is not ornamental. It's not an elective, and it isn't reserved for the elite. It is by design the inheritance and the birthright of everyone created in the image of our designer. Please do me a favor and do yourself a favor and never say that you're not creative again. Because when you say that, you deny the image of God that you've been made in. You are creative because you were made in the image of a creator. So we just kill that thing and leave that there and let's move on. <laughs> Whether you consider yourself an artist or not, you are the art of God. And exercising the freedom of creative expression is paramount for us becoming the children he has created us to be. Far from being an elective, so much of this journey of redemption if not the culmination of the entire thing, involves the regeneration of the creative nature of mankind functioning again in concert with the Holy Spirit under his direction. We are the poems of God sent forth to have an effect in the world. That's the way it was in the beginning. That's the way it'll be in the end. And that's the way I hope to help construct here in the middle of it all. But I believe that creativity before it is anything begins as a condition of the heart, an outlook and approach and a way of engaging life that leads us to live and respond with a quality of originality and innovation. Our most natural state as human beings is creative. When all the garbage is peeled away, when we're not functioning under the fear and the shame, and all of that other mess, the mar of sin, creativity is our most natural state. Before social confrontations teach us what's acceptable and what's not, before the constrictions that come around us and tell us what's possible and what's not, we are by nature creative, and I'll give you an example of that. My kids, your kids, our kids, us when we were children. Children, we play, we pretend, we exercise our imagination freely, we create scenarios, we become characters, cowboys, Indians, princesses, warriors. We build worlds and live out situations. We build forts and lead armies. See, our childhood play is actually really serious business. <laughs> and it's my personal belief that the roles that we play as children sometimes prophesy who we've really been called to be as adults. When my daughter puts on her princess dress and goes around the house, daddy says, yes and amen. And when my son whacks me over the head with his Ninja Turtle sword, I say, go to timeout. And then I say, yes and amen. <laughs> you are the superhero. The good guys will at least eventually win in the end, if it takes a while. But what's interesting and what is so beautiful is because I believe you can hear God in anything and miss God in anything. Ken Helser taught me that many, many years ago. And what confirmed that belief to me came to me uh, through an atheist scientist by the name of um, David Baum. And he wrote, he wrote a book called On Creativity, and it was amazing. This atheist scientist confirmed to me the very things that I was feeling from Scripture. It was beautiful. 
In his book, he compares the creative state of mind to that of a child absorbed in wholehearted attention and devotion. And then unfortunately, he says, as we grow older, we get afraid to make mistakes. We're taught to maintain an an image. We're taught to please our teachers, our bosses, our parents, and in many cases, for us, our pastors and leaders. And so the fertile grounds of discovery, the love of learning for the sake of learning, begins to dry up and harden, producing no new life. In short, we learn how to fear and withhold rather than to create and to give. We fear rejection. We fear failure. We fear consequences. We fear screwing up or fear that we've already screwed up. Fear of making mistakes leads to living a mechanical life. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, that was random. Focus. That was a that was a visual rabbit trail. And a mechanical life hardens us with preconceived notions and leaves no room for making innovative choices. No wonder we look back at our childhood as a lost paradise. No wonder Peter Pan refused to grow up. <laughs> Read Peter Pan. Do yourself a favor. At the end of the book, Wendy is trying to get him to grow up, and he says, you mean I'll have a beard one day? No. (laughs) You mean you'll send me to school and then to an office? No. (laughs) Come back to Neverland with me. But see, here's the beautiful thing. Jesus teaches that we must become as little children in order to see the kingdom of heaven. We must become as little children again, fearless, full of love, full of faith, full of curiosity, full of awe-stricken wonder. Childlikeness, the willingness to try something and just see what happens. Playfulness. All these things are the tenets of the Christian faith. This atheist scientist, uh, Mr. Baum, he wrote those things. He wrote how childlikeness, humility, love, all these things are what constitutes living a creative life. And I said, yes and amen. The disconnect was that he was not able to see the one that all of those things came from. When you and I are at rest in love and acceptance of God, we conduct ourselves in a strange, irreligious innocence. I'm going to say that again because it sounded cool. When we are at rest in the love and acceptance of God, we conduct ourselves in a strange, irreligious innocence. We're not afraid to step out and try new things. We're not afraid to fail or make mistakes. But when we're overly concerned about results, the thoughts of others, our steps become calculated, reserved, less likely to try new things that may not be accepted by those whom we seek to please. But you know, it's only love that gives us the courage to create. And creativity rooted in love will change the world. What do you think? Fear, on the other hand, is a prison of unreleased passion, a cell block that cloaks the creative spirit of God like a candle doubter. Isn't that ironic? Have you ever heard of a candle doubter? I didn't even know it was called a doubter. It's D-O-U-T-E-R, but I was looking up. What's that thing that snuffs out the... And I looked it up, and it said, a candle doubter. Wow. I don't want a candle doubter. (laughs) But if perfect love cast out fear, the opposite may also be true, that perfect fear inhibits receiving and giving love. And so what I've called this whole 
cacophony together for is to tell you this. Dramatic pause. (laughs) The world needs your art. The world needs your art. Probably more than you've realized probably more than you've allowed yourself to believe because perhaps you thought that if you believed that about yourself, you weren't being humble. And if that's pride, how can God use that? And then you get into all of that mental turmoil and then you try to step out, but then you're afraid that you're being self-centered and I can't be in the limelight because if people are looking at me, they'll think it's about me and they won't see God through me. So I better just not do it. (laughs) See, I just don't care anymore. (laughs) I'm his responsibility. (laughs) Well, to a degree, I'm going to get in trouble with that statement. (laughs) But now is the time for us to take courage, friends, peoples. Now is the time for us to face our fears and live out the art that God has created us to be. Now is the time for us to connect our piece of the puzzle to the greater purpose of his kingdom. And I'm sure you might be able to come up with a thousand reasons why what I just said isn't true, but it is. The world needs your art. Your own heart needs your art. The true and authentic art of your heart. See, in John 4, the Lord says, those who worship me will worship me in spirit and in truth. So when we are functioning in authenticity, God recognizes us. But if we're not true to who he's created us to be, we're living out somebody else's reality. Does that make sense? You know, and I was, I was thinking about this honestly just, and uh, this is off the page, but recently... As I was preparing for this weekend, I'm like, you know, Lord, and and what I'm going to say is pretty intense, but we're we're coming together and we're focusing on creativity, and we're focusing on art, we're focusing on beauty, we're focusing on music and all these things, and at the same time in the world right now, it is some very sobering things happening, from ridiculous diseases to our brothers and sisters across the ocean being killed for, the, for their faith, craziness in governmental systems. Everywhere we look, there's a reason to begin to believe that maybe creativity is ornamental, that maybe this art stuff should be pushed to the side. But I wanna say to you that it is precisely because of the darkness in the world right now that the world needs our art. It is precisely because of those things that we've got to shine brighter than we've ever shown before. It's because of those things that we have to get over ourselves. We've got to get over our own fears and just let God come through us. You know what? And if, and if, and if I trip up and if I make it about me, I don't care. I'll get up and, and go for it again because in my heart of hearts, in that true person that he recognizes, he knows what my heart desires. So let's just... Get rid of all the stuff that stops us and realize the world needs our art. I believe that the evil that we see in the world historically and the evil we see in the world present day is partially the result of a lack of beauty coming to people's hearts. When people do not have beauty, things get twisted sideways distorted, perverted versions of beauty begin to emerge because people don't know what true beauty is. And if you look all the way back into Genesis chapter two, verse nine, when it's talking about the trees of the garden that he created, it said that God made the trees both for beauty and for food. Genesis two, nine, he made them to be beautiful and he made them for food. What that tells me is this, in the same way that food nourishes our physical being, beauty and art nourishes the spirit man. Beauty and art nourishes our spirit. And when that is devoid of life, everything becomes about survival and mechanical living, fearful, 
driven out of all the wrong places. I believe that creativity and beauty and justice are intricately related, much more than we think. And I was reminded as I was studying for this that it was, you know, just as Mary's worship filled the atmosphere of that room, you remember when she came and she poured her life savings on the feet of Jesus, and Judas Iscariot got pretty angry about that because he, he, he feigned to care about the poor. And he said, you just wasted all of this, pouring it out on his feet when there's this desperate situation in the world. And Jesus' response was, wherever the gospel is told, her story will follow it. She has poured herself out on me. And because I am an eternal God, there is no lack within me. So don't think that just because she pours her worship, her art, her life out on my feet, that I can't in the same way take care of these world crises at the same time. Beauty and art and justice are intricately related. That's a sermon in itself, you know? That really is. I know that... That's just scratching the surface, but we could talk for days on that. I'm hoping this year to start a podcast called Makers and Mystics. And um, whether it's a weekly podcast or a monthly podcast, I don't know. I, it, the Lord's put it on my heart, but I want to do one called Makers and Mystics. And in each uh, series, I want to unpack different things like this and just talk about it all through the year. See, I'm not interested in church conferences. I'm interested in revolution. <laughs> I'm interested in seeing the purposes of God come to pass in our generation. Isaiah 61 tells us that for those whom the Spirit of God is active in their lives, they will be the ones who give beauty for ashes. That was in the first thing that Jesus preached when he stood and took his public ministry. Beauty for ashes. <sighs> so whether we're at the local art gallery, in concert halls or soup kitchens, those who are living in communion with his spirit, there is no facet of life that is not subject to becoming canvas of God's artistry. When we live from the heart in truth and authenticity, we become conduits of his artistry, and the world becomes our canvas. We paint our days with the colors of his love from the smallest mundane moments to the most epic encounters of our lives. And I just want to reiterate that the human need for beauty is no less vital to the soul of man than is food to the body. We are the art of God. We are his poems. And that's a good thing, huh? Father, we worship you tonight. Father, we worship you in your beautiful creativity and your beautiful creative expressions, Lord. We worship you, we love you. Father, we thank you for inviting us on this crazy, awesome journey full of risk and adventure and faith. And Father, thank you for initiating with us. And we just pray that tonight in this weekend and these relationships that we're forming, Father, I pray that, that you just cross-pollinate with us. Let this be a beehive this weekend. Let it be a place where we cross-pollinate and just Bask in the honey of who you are, Lord. Let, let this be a fire starter, Father, that, that would, would breathe your spirit, a fresh life into everyone here. For when everyone goes back to their worlds and their communities, Lord, Father, that your creative spirit, your creative function, your creative ideas, I just pray right now, you would just blow away the dust, blow away the fears, blow away um, the restrictions, Remove the candle doubters and give us 
the light of faith. <laughs> we worship you, Papa. In Jesus' name, amen.